Hello, dear friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you back to Tuesday Night Learning at the Shar. We're in for a treat this evening. David Frum in conversation with Janice Stein, the topic, American Democracy, a Health Report. I can't help but reflect on, on this day as we've just concluded the first yard site, the first anniversary of the passing of Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, one of the great thinkers, theologians, sages, leaders of morality of our, of our times. And, and he wrote on this topic of democracy quite a bit and pointed out that it's not a natural state of being, that there have been many times in, in history and in recent history in which one would think that democracy is about to spread throughout the world. And yet, and yet what happens is that it doesn't, it doesn't reach where we think it will reach, whether it's the fall of, of, of the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union's collapse, or whether it's more recently the Arab Spring, one would think that democracy would be the natural state of being after, after the fall of other these of all these other forms of, of government, and yet it it simply doesn't happen in that way. Democracy, being a great gift of of our tradition, and as Rabbi Sachs noted, democracy was born from two civilizations: from a Greek civilization on the one hand, and on the other hand of of what we call Judeo-Christian values which teach according to our Torah, which teach that every human being is created in the Im image of God, which teaches a sense of equal value amongst humanity, which then teaches that each human being deserves to have a say and a voice in how they're governed and how, and how society looks and in, in the concepts that, that dictate and that, that allow us to live our lives with the greatest sense of freedom and, and liberty. And we offer our prayers that Rabbi Sachs's memory be a blessing and that our conversation about democracy this evening be one in which we offer gratitude for for the many gifts of of our lives and for the simple muzzle of have being being born in the time and place that that we have and been able to live in this extraordinary country of canada wonderful to to have you with us and it's my pleasure now to turn it over to lewis dobrin who will introduce our speakers this evening and please note that at the end of the evening, at the end of the session, we'll invite Barbara Kay to close the evening and to thank our speakers. Wonderful to have you here, Erev Tov. Enjoy the session. Rabbi, ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to be living here in Canada. A week ago, October 16th, Saturday opinion section of the Globe and Mail featured an article by Parag Kana entitled, Searching for the American Dream? Go to Canada. Canada opines that, quote, the Canadian dream is much more attainable. Canada is a policy lab for experiments in reducing inequality. The country is far from perfect, but it ranks far higher than the US in social mobility. David Frum, our speaker tonight, observed that Canadians may have a hard time understanding American politics right now for two reasons. First, over the past 15 years, the developed country where the middle class has done best is Canada. The United States is towards the bottom of the 25 developed countries in the OECD for how the middle class has fared. Second is the fact that Canadian experience with immigration has been dramatically more successful than the American experience. Immigrants to Canada are highly skilled and educated and less likely to commit crimes than the native born. The Americans have a different experience with both things, which accounts for their politics being to say the least, a lot more frantic, hard-edged, and insecure. Let's cut to the chase. Tonight's topic is American democracy, a health report. I'm looking forward to the conversation, but I do not anticipate it to be sanguine. We all know liberal democracy finds itself in crisis the world over. It is not only in Poland and Hungary that populist leaders are undermining independent institutions, destroying the free media, muzzling the opposition, and firing up populist anger against immigrants. It is sad and shocking that the most striking manifestation of democracy's crisis is the US of A. In 2016, for the first time in its history, a president was elected without any political experience, having never served as a congressman, senator, governor, or ex-general. The oldest and most powerful democracy in the world elected a president who, in the final presidential debate with Hillary Clinton, openly disdained constitutional norms. Somebody who left his supporters in suspense whether he would accept the outcome of the 216 election, who called his main political opponent to be jailed, 
and who consistently favored the country's authoritarian adversaries over its democratic allies. This time around, in the November 2020 election, how can one be surprised that Trump has refused to accept the legitimacy of his defeat? Trump repeatedly stated throughout the campaign on the record that the only possibility for his defeat would be the only possibility for his defeat would be a rigged election. So, sorry about that. The only possibility of defeat would have been a rigged election. What is shocking is how the GOP is following suit. In the opinion section of the New York Times this past October 21st, Brett Stevens in conversation with Gail Collins asks her, what do you think the chances are that the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and the House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy will ever challenge Donald Trump on his claim of election fraud? Gail's response, well, about the same as my chances of competing in the next Olympics. Brett retorts, your chances are better. In a recent rally in Iowa, Trump focused on a single issue, the last election. He is making the stolen election fantasy a litmus test for Republicans to defy at their peril. I won't even get into Trump's incitement to his followers to attack the Capitol on January 6 in an attempt to thwart the election results. This is all so ugly and scary. Little wonder this has set off a furious competition among American pundits to explain what is going on. David Frum is at the front of the pack with two books, Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic, and, Trump and Trump Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. I gained many insights from these two excellent books. Frum, of course, despises Donald J. Trump and all he has done to trample on the norms of government and undermine in countless ways the rule of law. The two books draw on a series of Frum's articles in The Atlantic, where he is a senior editor. Trump explains that Trump is a symptom, not a cause. Donald Trump is brilliant, really a genius at exploiting weakness. Frum examines what Trump's rise and hold on so many Americans tell us about the deep structural problems of America in general and conservatism in particular. A significant underlying problem has been that wages have stagnated in recent decades, and to the extent that net income has increased, it has been collected at the top 10% of the population. There is rage out there, and Trump appeals to voters who have lost faith in their country and in themselves. Frum makes an, makes an essential contribution to our understanding of the deep crisis the US now faces. It is fair to say that Trump never seriously attempted to expand his voting coalition because he was unable to keep in check his rage and his hate. Even so, 74 million people voted for him in 2020, 9 million more than in 2016, and the most votes ever cast for a US president, with the exception of Joe Biden, who garnered 81 million. Much of the elite press, be it the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and 60 Minutes are left-leaning and vehemently anti-Trump. We all know this has little impact on core Trump supporters. Not surprisingly, Trump believes the press is biased and viciously hostile to him. Fake news. What is novel and interesting about David Frum is that he is a man of the right, a conservative with impeccable Republican credentials. Frum says of himself, quote, I'm a conservative Republican. I've been all my adult life. I volunteered for the Reagan campaign in 1980. I've attended every Republican convention since 1988. I was president of the Federalist Society while at law school. Later, I worked on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal and wrote speeches for President George W. Bush. It is ironic that David Frum, who has spent his whole life inside the GOP establishment, is now on a warpath against it. People ask, what's gotten into David Frum? He answers, look in the mirror. Fromm has broken free of Republican groupthink. He believes that the GOP has lost touch with reality. Fromm has not become a liberal, nor is he by nature an optimist. Mostly, he believes the right has changed, not him. He is trying to get, he is trying to get them back on course, but thus far with little success. David Fromm makes a conservative's case against Donald Trump. He is principled and has an ingrained sense of right and wrong. 
It's interesting that his favorite historical figures are Alexander Hamilton and Abraham, and Abraham Lincoln, each personifying American exceptionalism. Well, David Crumb himself is exceptional. At Yale University, he simultaneously earned a BA and MA in history, and then earned a JD from Harvard Law School. He's the author of 10 books. He is married to the writer, Danielle Crittenden, and they have three children. David Frum is unquestionably one of the most influential political analysts of our time. People want to know what David Frum is thinking on any number of issues. Even if you don't agree with his views, his encyclopedic knowledge of hot topic issues is unmatched. Now, let me turn to our renowned interlocutor this evening, the inimitable Janice Stein. What is unusual about this powerhouse of a lady is that while she is a respected academic, she has her ear close to the ground and intuits with remarkable accuracy the outcome of referenda and elections. It is hard not to marvel at Janice Stein's street smarts. She is the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. She has authored two books and co-authored five. We met for the first time in 2012 at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where she was being awarded an honorary doctorate, one of four that she holds. Janice and I have a strong bond because she was the closest friend of my cousin, Blima Steinberg, of blessed memory. This is Janice's second visit to the Shar. She spoke in conversation with Stephen Lipper one week prior to the 2020 US election. And to date, that talk has had 730 views. I can't wait to hear the conversation between this dynamic duo. Janice, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And David, um, it is great um, to be with you in conversation. It is really um, a personal pleasure as well as just great fun. Um, we're going to talk about democracy tonight, but I'm going to take you on a bit of a circuitous journey. I'm going to postpone talking about the Republican Party for just a few minutes. Uh, I know you have just come back from Nigeria. And um, first of all, tell us how it feels to travel and more, how are people outside the United States seeing the United States and the world right now? Janice, it's such a pleasure to talk to you again. It's been too long, and and thank you for alluding. If, if I um, seem dopey, um, it's it's early in the morning Nigerian time, and this is my first first day back. Um, so when when I planned my trip to Nigeria, I was told that uh, be careful. This is a country with um, uh, fractionalized, tribalized, uh, divided politics. It's a country of extreme inequalities of wealth and poverty. Uh, it's a country bloodied by dissension, tainted by corruption, and and uh, upset from time to time by upsurges of seemingly costless violence. So, well, after all these years living in the United States, I think I'm going to feel right at home. Uh, it's it, Nigeria is a tough country uh, to visit. They don't really want you there, um, and uh, the the visa process is difficult. Many things are very difficult. Uh, I, I have to tell you that. Uh, the most hostility to any country I heard while I was in Nigeria was toward Canada. Um, I, I remember, I remember, I, I was at a, I was at one of the events I was at that they um, I was talking to a number of leading figures who talked about how predatory they felt Canadian immigration policy was toward Nigeria. That Canada would swoop in and take their best. Um, the person who um, made this complaint most eloquently to me was someone whose own children lived in Canada, and he was not entirely pleased about that. Um, but uh, it, is a, it is a complex place, and um, I, I certainly do feel I, I learned a lot. I was there to report a story, and I'll be writing that story for The Atlantic, or uh, it'll be uh, writing it over the next week, and it'll be published early in 2022. Oh, good. Did you sense that the United States is still regarded as the exceptional power that it wants? Does it have the same heft, David, uh, that it's had over the last 30 years, certainly? Nigeria is a bad place to get uh, get a sense of this because um, uh, 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 followed by the Philippines, followed, I'm sad to say, by Israel. Um, and we can talk about why this is so. Part of the reason is the um, uh, extraordinary influence of the Pentecostal church in Nigeria. I, I, I visited with a group of Pentecostal elders 
um, and they have a strong sense of themselves as being um, at the edge of a religious conflict with their um, Muslim fellow citizens. Nigeria is, at least according to the official census, approximately half and half Muslim and Christian. Um, there's some reason to doubt the official census is quite accurate. The Christian numbers may be larger than the Muslim numbers. Um, but it, it's a knife edge society and they, they like Trump. Um, and as I say, and they're mad at Canada for taking all their doctors. Well, you know, we do have an immigration policy, which is talent based. Uh, we don't talk about this very often, but it's, it's not an invalid comment. Uh, let me turn to what's going on in Washington uh, right now, David, and following on your last book, where you talk about the inequality in the United States as a driver of some of the things you worry most about. There seems to be a life and death struggle in Congress right now uh, to pass probably the most ambitious two bills that we have seen in recent memory. Uh, how do you see the prospects of the legislation that the Biden administration is trying to get through Congress clearly on an extraordinarily partisan basis without any Republican support whatsoever? Well, I think we need to worry about this a little bit. Um, so the Biden administration has already pa successfully passed a very, very large COVID relief bill, um, and they're now planning to pass a second large uh, spending bill. Um, the concern here, at least my concern, is uh, we're all familiar with these kinks in the supply chains, uh, the difficulty of produce uh, of of getting goods and services across the Earth's surface, um, shortages of things like um, foods, especially meats, um, uh, and what has been happening in the United States, especially, is that even as the even before the supply problems are solved, uh, that more and more purchasing power is being put in the hands of the consumer. And so the result is we have shortages on the supply side, enormous purchasing power on the consumer side, and this is expressing itself in rising prices, especially in prices most visible to the consumer. Um, there's a big argument in the United States about whether we should call this inflation or not. And that's a kind of technical economic argument because an inflation is a monetary phenomenon where money in general loses its value against goods and services in general. And there are many goods and services where um, the price is going down to compute computing technology, communications technology, those things are, are becoming cheaper. And so it may not be that the overall cost of everything is going up, or rather I should say that the overall value of money is going down. But what is happening is in the most visible prices, there are spectacular increases. Price of gas, price of food, price of meat, even more than food, price of beef, even more than other meats. And these are real, these right now, I mean, the, the, the surveys are finding that prices are overtaking COVID is the number one concern of the American voter. And it's going to be a big problem for the Biden administration. Talk a little bit, David, about the deeper drivers here, because this is a big, this is a, a major call, whether we label this inflation and raise interest rates and about six, same argument going on in this country with mm -hmm. the governor of our bank, Tiff Macklin firmly locked in on one side of this and actually being criticized now by some of the CEOs of the banks. So talk a little bit, one, about what is called the great resignation. Is this temporary or do you see this as a big structural change yeah. in America? Uh, and then uh, the second big problem is the disruption in global supply chains. That is the supply side of this. Is that temporary? Is it just COVID created or are you seeing something bigger, deeper, long lasting here? Look, everything is temporary. Um, the Roman empire was temporary. Now, um, the question is how long is this temporary situation? Um, so uh, let, let me talk about something I, I did a lot of work on recently for the Atlantic and that is the price of beef. So um, the price of beef is being driven. We, we've had some bad droughts in the United States uh, we've had, um, because of COVID hit meat packing plants, especially hard. And so the workers used to be crowded very close together. Uh, now they're separated farther apart. So that means each worker, there, there are fewer workers in the plants. They, the plants can process less meat. The cows, because of the droughts, even the meat that process, the cows are smaller. So even if you're processing almost as many cows as you were before, not quite almost as many, the cows weigh less, you get less beef out of them. And all of this in the face of consumers who are continuing to bid ever more frantically for that 
temporarily reduced amount of beef. Um, uh, I, I don't want to make big predictions about whether, and I, I, I don't think the argument whether to call this inflation is fruitful or not, but um, it is true that what the, the Biden people are doing is cramming ever more purchasing power. And let me give you a very concrete example. Their, their, their current spending bill is called an infrastructure bill. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we know about the United States is for every hundred dollars of infrastructure spending, the United States gets less infrastructure, never mind than Canada or Australia, but then France. Um, it caught, it, the United States spends, spends, pays more per mile of track to run trains. It pays more for dams. And, and I would think if I were doing a big infrastructure bill, the first thing I would do before I put more money into the process, I would want to know why does the money we spend buy less? But the Biden people had this idea that if only we can just muster enough purchasing power, we can levitate ourselves out of the COVID crisis. And the real risk is that we're going to have a price increase spasm. And there's one more thing about the price increase that is very dangerous to the Biden administration which is, you mentioned the, the so-called great resignation, and this is the labor supply problem. Now, as I- just, just explain to people what it is. Okay, so um, in, look, if, if you wanna be a, a runner on a movie set, that is no easier than it used to be. If you wanna be a vice president at Goldman Sachs, that's no easier than it used to be. But if you wanna bag groceries, uh, you have many more options than you used to do, and you're going to pay, get a higher wage. The starting salary at an Amazon warehouse is now $18 an hour. Remember the argument about whether the, the minimum wage in the United States should be raised to $15, and Biden tried to propose that and it failed. But the fact is, right now, the minimum wage is $15, and many places are paying $18. So what is driving this? Um, why are why is in labor it's in seemingly short supply? Not, and not only in the United States, but across the developed world. So the, there are a couple of factors in the United States that are, I think, general and then one that is specific. The first issue is um, women are missing from the labor force. Um, that um, daycare and schools have not come on back fully online after COVID. And so we have hundreds of thousands of missing women who can't get childcare and so are not coming back to work. Uh, the second thing that is going on is after the financial crisis of 2008, the baby boomers slowed their retirement from the workforce. And after, 20, after the shock of 2020, when people were told to stay home, the baby boomers accelerated their retirement from the workforce. Third thing, and, and this is America specific, is America, had, remember, had this huge op opioid problem in 2017 and 18. It got a little better in 2019, probably because the economy was so strong, there was so much demand for labor, people said, you know what, I'm going to put away the pills and, and, and do the job and support my kids. Then people were sent home in 2020 and they were given stimulus checks. So 2020 was the highest year for opioid deaths ever, higher even than the previous peak in 2016. And so that drug crisis is it, the state where the so-called great resignation, the disappearance of workers is most intense is Kentucky, which is also ground zero for the opioid crisis. The second state is Idaho, another ground zero for the opioid crisis. So. Missing women, ex baby boomers retiring faster than, or accelerating their withdrawal, the, the drug crisis. And what is happening to all of this is it's flashing a giant America to world help wanted message. And so you have this border crisis where unprecedented numbers of people are trying to cross the border, claiming to be seeking asylum, really looking for those $18 an hour jobs at the Amazon warehouses. And that is creating another crisis for the Biden administration because it's, it's torn. It wants to let them in. The public basically doesn't. The employers are saying, please, 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 we need these people. Um, but they're break. I mean- They do, they do need these, they do need well, them. Well, yes and no, but the, the, the problem is they're using a legal system that was invented, a legal rule that was invented to bring in Otto Frank and his daughters. And um, yeah. people were being persecuted for their race or religion or ethnicity. And in fact, they're using it to allow people in Guatemala who'd like to get Amazon jobs into the United States. And it's, it's obviously not on the level. And, and um, it, it has big political problems. So but Biden, you know, one of the things that really matters in being president is being lucky. Um, Bill Clinton was lucky. Um, Bill Clinton didn't have anything to do with the development of the internet at all, but it showed up in 1996, just in time to boost the economy and get him reelected. 
Jimmy Carter was unlucky. Um, most of the problems that beset him weren't his fault, um, but they still capsized his presidency. And Biden right now is looking a lot more like an unlucky than a lucky president. Yeah. David, walk us through just the next month or two in Congress. Um, and certainly from the outside, if no legislation can get through Congress uh, and uh, this first tranche of unlucky Biden uh, mm -hmm. ends with what the rest of us will look at as paralysis, what does that do um, to the level of um, optimism about the United States and its capacity to recover um, and to regenerate its political institutions? Um, if Biden gets a big loss, he's going to look very bad in the eyes of Washington. But if he gets a win, it may actually do him more harm. Um, and that I would advise people, and I know people who are watching us and who are involved with this program are, are highly attuned news people. Um, one of the things I find helpful to keep saying is I think about football. So I know approximately that the Super Bowl is in the early part of the year. Um, about two weeks before the Super Bowl, I'll know the exact date. About a week before the Super Bowl, I'll know who's in it. And the day before, I might be able to name a player or two. And then when the Super Bowl is actually played, if my son is home, he watches it, I'll, I'll wander in for the last 10 minutes and enjoy his enthusiasm. Otherwise, I have no blinking idea. And so I, what I always try to remember is what the way I feel about the Super Bowl is the way most people feel about politics. Um, and uh, the very fact of knowing a lot about it almost disqualifies you to comment about it because you don't see it. And Joe Biden's superpower in the election of 2020 was he never forgot that the next president of the United States would be chosen by a 52 year old white woman who hadn't graduated from college, who worked as a checkout clerk at Target or Walmart, and who gave politics about 15 minutes thought every year. He knew she would pick the president. There's a story about the Biden people. I hope it's true. I've been told it by a lot of people. I've never verified it because it's too good. But when you were applying for a job at the Biden campaign, the last thing, if you were doing well, the last question they would say, okay, you've almost got the job. One more question. Do you have Twitter on your phone? Well, of course, delete it. They didn't want you being, they wanted you to enter into the mind space of that 52 year old white woman working at Target and say, what is she thinking about? And what your progressive friends are talking about on Twitter is not on her mind. Um, and so a lot of things that, that happen, um, what she cares about is the price of ground chuck at Walmart. She cares about fuel. Um, she cares about being able to, um, she's probably a little old for sending her kids to school, but she cares about her, maybe her grandchildren or younger sister's children. Can they go to school? And those are the criteria of, of success for the Biden administration. Um, and I don't want to exaggerate that, but like Af when people say, oh, Afghanistan, I mean, it's, huh. Afghanistan is, a, is obviously a fiasco in many ways. It does it have any off. impact? Does it have, and you should be able to hold in your mind the thought that I, I care about it, but I'm not going to project what I care about onto the median voter. Um, the median voter, uh, the median, vo I mean, I don't care about the Kardashians. That doesn't make them unimportant. Um, I do care about Afghanistan, but that doesn't make it politically important. One last question before we move to the Republican side of this story, David. I think what the woman that you're talking about in Kansas does care about, that her husband or her son can get an 18 hour, uh, $18 an hour job. Mm -hmm. um, and that is changing in the United States for all the complex reasons. She doesn't really care why it's changing, but it is changing. And there are far more employment opportunities for people who don't have a college education than there was even to, does that make a difference? Yeah, but look, we can measure it. Um, the uh, Biden polls num poll, poll numbers are a little weak. Um, and one of the things that, and, and this is a strange thing because back in the 1970s and 80s, we knew that the, per, the state of the economy was enormously important to presidential elections. And it looks like that is ceasing to be true. Um, 
And it, it looks like tribal identity is so powerful. It used to be that people would say, um, is the economy strong? Yes, then I like the president. Is the economy weak? No, then I dislike the president. In, instead, what is happening now, and there's a lot of data on this, is people say, do I like the president? Yes, then I believe the economy is strong. Mm -hmm. Do I dislike the president? Yes, then I believe the economy is weak. And that it's, it's not, it is no longer the economy stupid. It is now the identity stupid. You know, one of the things that political scientists a generation ago, um, your teachers believed, was it's really bad that American economy, politics is so crass and about things. Um, in the olden days, it was about did the political boss bring you a turkey at Thanksgiving or, or a sack of coal, then later became about bridges and dams. And people would, and the political scientists said, if only we could get politics to be about ideas and principles, then be so much better. So they got their wish. Yeah. And what you discover is when the politics is about turkeys from the political, the Tammany Hall boss, or about oh. dams and bridges, you would compromise on those. But when we climb up Maslow's hierarchy, and those of you know, us of a certain age, so Maslow said, we begin with physical needs and we move to emotional needs and psychic needs and spiritual needs. When politics becomes a way of expressing our, our innermost best and highest self, that's when it becomes really vicious. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, and, you know, as you told that story about identity politics replacing Turkey politics, that's a really scary story. And that's an, a, a nonpartisan scary story. And it's true throughout the developed world, by the way. This is true. This is not an American story. It's true. It's France. true in France and Canada and in Norway that, um, as I said, there's a lot of data about how it used to, that, that what matters today like, uh, is. I, mean, some, I was talking today with a political scientist who said, we have to look back at the 70s to know how does inflation affect a president's poll numbers? And I said, that's useless because that was a different world. I, 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 whether it affected a lot or a little, in, I mean, in 1976, um, there were people who could, there, a fifth of the country could vote Democratic in one election and Republican in the next. That's just not true. We're, we're down probably to five to 8% of right. the country that will vote Democratic in some elections and Republican in others. The data show that Republicans and Democrats can't intermarry. Right. Uh, That's right. A, famous, a famous survey, right. A famous survey. So that is a, that is a real stretch. David, I, I know um, that you must be thinking about January the 6th, which was a seminal and shocking event in U.S. politics when the Capitol was stormed. Uh, the lawyers... Uh, and the prosecutors are still unraveling the story and, yeah. and people are still being charged and the full story is not out. But what is clear, as Lewis said in the introduction, uh, that Trump accepts no responsibility, no ownership, and nor does the broader Republican Party. What does that tell you about the health of democracy, which you um, talk so much about? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very... Um, you know, one, one of the things that all has always puzzled me, and I think it's irked many Canadians is, okay, so on every inauguration day, January the 20th of uh, the year after the election, um, there's a lot of airtime to fill because uh, the inauguration happens at noon, but they start broadcasting at nine and there's, and it's mostly bitterly cold and there are a lot of empty chairs. So there's not a lot to say. And so they just, they just blather. And, and, and especially in the nine to 10 hour, they, they, they it's like, you know, Anyway, so the thing they talk about is this uniquely American miracle of the peaceful transfer of power. You know, I wonder what our Dutch friends think. Like the Dutch, had, like one prime minister, you know, loses office, hails a taxi, goes home. Another prime minister wins office, hails a taxi, goes to the prime minister's office. It's not a big deal. In fact, what is true about the United States is it's the democracy in which the peaceful transfer of power is most in question. Um, and that's always... And I think the reason Americans congratulate themselves so much on this is because they're so worried about it. Um, you know, I mean, it really is true. Watch what happens when a prime minister in the UK loses power. I mean, he is literally out on Whitehall hailing a cab. Ten days. Was, ten days. Yeah. Ten days. That, that's, that's new. It used to be like 10 minutes and you took your boxes out, you know, and, and your wife had the grocery bags and the suitcases and you were looking for a cab on Whitehall. Um, so, but that tradition of the peace that broke in 2020 was not a peaceful transfer of power. So we've had to restart the clock. Um, but here's the thing I and if, if those of you who are 
frequent watchers of cable news. One of the things I really caution you about is cable news loves to book, and they're very abundant, former federal prosecutors to talk about what indictable offenses have or have not been committed. And so you get this idea that there are two kinds of things that happen in the world. One are indictable offenses, and the other is things that are okay. And that one of the themes I've been striking again and again, and this one, I was very opposed, for example, to the appointment of a special counsel back in 2017 to investigate the Russia matter, is there is a vast zone of things that are not indictable crimes, but are also not okay. And the United States doesn't have a, a cultural mechanism or is in danger of losing its cultural mechanism to deal with those things that are bad, wrong, inappropriate, unethical, but not actually prosecutable or indictable crimes. And I think we're going to find that with January 6th. Um, there's, a, there's a saying attributed to Huey, Huey Long. I don't know if he was the first person to say it. Never write what you can say. Never say what you can nod. Never nod what you can wink. And never wink what the other fellow knows already. And I think there's going to be zero evidence that Trump was in any way in command of the violence. It's also obvious that he appreciated it, relished it, and did all he could to incite it. So people are going to be looking for, and you're going to have all these former federal prosecutors talking about chains of custody and evidence, evidentiary standards and federal rule this. And it's just a waste. And, and they're going to then lead us down the same rabbit hole that Mueller led us to say, at the end, we're going to discover these are not indictable offenses. And they're certainly, certainly not convictable because there isn't enough beyond a reasonable doubt. So ever. just and, for the record, David, they're not indictable offenses for the president. There are clearly a set of indictable offenses for some of the people who participated. Yeah, in yeah. Oh, but, yeah but uh, you know, okay, so we're going to send a bunch of loser weirdos to jail for trespassing. You know, yeah. a a Abraham Lincoln had um, this when he uh, was arresting uh, and without legal right um, some of the propagandists for the Confederacy in the North. And he was challenged and he was much criticized for it at the time and since. And he, and he said, must I shoot the simple minded soldier boy who deserts his post and spare the, and spare not one hair on the head of the wily agitator who induced him to desert? So, yeah, a, a lot of these schlemiels are going to be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they didn't think this up on their own. They're morons. They didn't think of it on there. They're crazy people. Um, they were talked into it. So what we want to deal with is the people who, in, uh, um, who induced it. But the people who induced it, you are not going to have I agree. indictable offenses and certainly convictable offenses beyond a reasonable doubt. And so we're going to leave the, the idea behind. Um, we're going to, you know, they're going to face all the publicity of the law and they're ultimately going to be let go. And then we're going to, oh, what, what they all did was fine because it wasn't a it wasn't criminally convictable. Yeah. Uh, but there, there is this vast zone between what is acceptable and what is criminal. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. Put it in a historical context, David. You said we've got to start the clock again. Generally speaking, you look back in American history, except for the period of the American Civil War, how fragile is the transfer of power? Because it is, you know, we judge democracies by how well we lose not how well we win. Right. So how fragile is that in the United States? Um, it, so the United States has great strengths as a democracy, um, but it has some weaknesses compared to others. And, and some of them are, one of the things that's, that's worth thinking about is the United States doesn't have a civil service yeah. the way the other democracies do. And that's both, a, um, uh, it's a strength because like what one, you know, uh, supposing you're kind of an out there candidate, um, you know, a Margaret Thatcher or her counterpart on the left, and you win power in a country like Canada or Britain, it's very hard to get anything done because of the yes minister problem that all the people, they'll do what you tell them, but they'll do e exactly what you tell them and only what you tell them. And if you don't know what to tell them, they won't help you out. Um, so an American president uh, who has new ideas of, of whether it's a Ronald Reagan or a Bill Clinton, they can come into power and they can bring thousands of like-minded people with them and they can set them in motion, say, make the government go. 
Um, but what that also means is the government doesn't work automatically. I mean, that, uh, and here's an example. This is where, um, this is one of the funniest stories and also one of the most, this is where America is most likely the democracies. Um, the one exception to the rule about no civil service is the military. So one of the things Donald Trump wanted to do when he became president was have a giant military parade. That was, that was a really, he wanted it for his inauguration. It was a super high priority. And the military didn't want to do it. And they didn't want to do it for a bunch of reasons. Uh, it was expensive. It looked political. Um, it's also because modern the, the, the soldiers are highly trained professionals. Their time is extremely valuable. And uh, the idea that you, and, and all the things you do on a parade are like military skills from the 18th century. And it's just a waste of time to persuade, to get a bunch of people who have to do fight modern wars to march in line. That, that, that was really useful if you were Napoleon Bonaparte, it ain't useful now, and they have to practice, and it's just a waste, of, and they hate it, and they could be with their families before they go back to, you know, sitting with the control knobs and mo mobilizing drones to kill terrorists in South Yemen. Um, so the military didn't want to do it, and just came up with reason after reason as to why they, they couldn't. And they would say things like, well, Mr. President, if we run these tanks uh, down the streets of Washington, D.C., it's going to tear up the asphalt and it will cost $80 million to replace the asphalt. And, and we don't have budget for that. And the president said, I don't believe it'll cost $80 million. And they would leak to The Washington Post their survey that it would cost $80 million and they didn't have budget for it. And they just refused. They didn't refuse because that would be disobedient, but they just didn't do it. Stonewalled. Stonewalled. They just, they just kept coming up with, they kept asking new questions. Yeah. That, that question, well, do you mean this? Do you mean that? Okay, so that's that's the best and worst of this. The best of it is Trump, Trump ended up getting two park tanks and a, and a fly past, um, which is what college football teams, he got the same thing as college football teams get for like the Rose Bowl. He got like six jets flying over his head. Um, uh, but he didn't get marching troops up Pennsylvania Avenue the way he wanted. But it's, it's also true that that meant, um, so they, they, they were able to defy him. Um, but that's, but elsewhere that didn't happen. Um, and one of the things that is really dangerous when you think about a second Trump term is in his first term, Trump was like a new householder who didn't understand how the fuse box worked and the lights kept going out and he didn't know how to turn them back on. But when he comes back, if he comes back, he will know better. Back then he didn't know it's, it's not enough to appoint a stooge attorney general. You need a stooge assistant attorney general for the criminal division. He didn't know that. Now he knows it. David, um, talk about the Republican Party. Um, this divide where it appears that the president has the overwhelming support uh, of Republican voters in large parts of the country. The machinery is not the machinery that you knew four years ago or eight years ago. And the leadership in the House and the Senate, it seems to me, uh, is struggling <laughs> to find its voice because they are looking over their shoulder at the president yeah. all the time. Um, most of the leadership of the Republican Party, the elected leadership, wants to move to a post-Trump environment, but they want somebody else to do the posting. And because no one is doing that, we've created these incentives where um, people like Rick DeSantis, the governor of Florida, my, I remember I, I, I used to know him a little bit. No moron, um, no crank. Um, so he's certainly vaxxed and his wife is vaxxed and his kids are vaxxed and everyone, and anyone who wants to come into contact with him is vaxxed, but, but he has been driven and so many others have been driven to pretending to be something other than what they really are because they're in a bidding contest against Donald Trump. And, and the thing they're going to, all going to discover is you cannot be more sociopathic. Than Donald Trump. However, sociopathic you could, there's there's going to be some. They're just things you're. You, even if you do them, you won't do them fast enough and instinctively enough and gleefully enough. It'll it'll show in the crinkles of your eyes that you're upset. Um, you can't quite. You know. Most even mean people, if offered the choice of giving five dollars of someone else's money to a panhandler or kicking the panhandler would prefer to give the $5 of someone else's money to the panhandler. And even if they understand there's a payoff to kicking the panhandler, they sort of hesitate and they don't kick them real hard. 
the idea of sort of running across the road and giving a big wind up and, and kicking him and then doing a kind of victory lap about how hard you kick the panhandler, I, you're never going to win against Donald Trump at that contest. But people keep hoping but somebody they, else will do it. But David, are, are they just going to cede the ground here? Yeah. So let's let's get you out on the limb now. Um, do you think that President Trump will win the Republican nomination? And I mean, no, it's three years out. That is a long time. If he's in health, yeah, um, then it looks like yes. Now that's a big if because um, you know one of the uh, one of the one of the sort of questions is does McDonald's filet fish turn out to be the fountain of youth? Because like everything you shouldn't do is what he does. And he's actually pretty vigorous for a man in his middle seventies. But it's um, a slender threat to hang your hope on, right? right. But yeah. if he's in health, then it looks like he will be the Republican nominee. And um, and one of the things that may be ironic is that people like Rick DeSantis are gonna find they have a much tougher, he is up for reelection as governor of Florida in 2022. And he's gonna be, he's alienated a lot of suburban voters because of his anti-vax positions, which he has done in hope of winning the Republican nomination. And the joke's going to be on him if he's at, if he has a tough or unsuccessful reelect in 22 because of vax stuff that he himself doesn't believe in, in his effort to get the nomination in 24 that Donald Trump is going to win anyway if he is in health. The question of what happens in the general election is much more complicated. And that depends on a bunch of factors, and not least something that I hope everyone is paying a lot of attention to, which is the crisis in the Chinese property market. And we are all about to find out how connected China is to the rest of the world. And there's been a lot of effort trying to be less connected. Just, to just for everybody that David, I think, is referring to Evergrande, the biggest Chinese real estate developer, $300 billion in debt, has defaulted on the last two payments, just made one but it is a rickety, rickety, fragile real estate market in China, which is 20% of their economy. And this, this morning, early this morning, the second biggest developer also defaulted, a company called Modern Life. Um, if you've seen the play, The Importance of Being Earnest, you know that great line to lose, you know, where, some, where the leading character says, I'm for, I've had the misfortune to lose both my parents. And Lady Bracknell replies, to lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune, to, look, to lose both looks like carelessness. And they, China has now lost two of its top two biggest property developers. And that begins to look like carelessness. And we are going to find out whether that has implications for the rest of the world economy. Let's hope not. It might even force positive reforms on China. It might be ultimately a good thing. But um, if we are heading into an economic downturn because of it, that, again, complicates the situation for the Biden presidency. David, Abigail, um, one of our audience tonight, asked about voter suppression uh, mm -hmm. and the bills that are uh, in front of or have been passed by 12 states. And the, one of the big issues uh, in Congress we haven't talked about is if you cannot get uh, any Republican support at all, should Biden um, and the Democrats go for broke overturn the filibuster in order to get a voting rights bill through. Is this the make it or break it moment for American yeah. democracy? Well, I, I'm certainly in favor of getting rid of the filibuster. It's just bizarre that, um, and by the way, and it's new. This is a, not an ancient tradition. That this idea that everything takes 60 votes, that, that's a phenomenon of the past really 15 years. Um, and historically, um, 50% plus one was, was enough to pass things through the Senate as it is through every other body. And filibusters were very rare. Um, and always, by the way, in the, in the past, always about racial matters. They, they were a weapon for the white South against civil rights laws. But I would just, so I'm, yes, they should overturn the filibuster just because it's, it's crazy. Um, but I would be careful about overstating the impact of voter suppression laws. Uh, what we've discovered, a couple of things about the voter suppression. The first is what we've discovered is um, voter suppression often back, backfires, as, uh, as was demonstrated in 2020. It actually, you, a lot of people are too despairing to vote. The voter suppression sort of gets them excited. The second thing to remember is that the group of people who are most committed to vote are well-educated, women, especially well-educated white women. And that's one of the most anti-Trump constituencies. And meanwhile, the, the Republicans are doing increasingly well with 
less educated men, especially Latino men, and they are the people who are most easily suppressed. So these, these measures could easily backfire on, on the Republican Party. But the most important Republican advantage does not come from voter suppression. It comes from the rural bias of the whole that runs through the whole American voting system, some part of, of which is a phenomenon of law, but some part of it is just is true in every other demo, every democracy is that if, if you're going to have any kind of geographically based representation, you end up over representing areas where the population is shrinking and over because you can never quite catch up and over representing the areas where the population is growing. And this true is true in, Canada, in the, true in Canada too, David, exactly. True in Canada, true. It, it's, it's, and, um, and the only answer to that is to sever representation from geography as they do in say Germany and Israel, but that has other problems. Um, then the MPs become purely ideological. They don't represent real people with real problems. Um, so there's a rural bias in the American, but and the American system has the strongest rural bias. It's stronger at the state level than it is at the federal level. So even without voter suppression, the Republicans have a, a field that's in their favor. One more question, David, before we go to the audience. Um, I, I'm sure you read this apocalyptic article by Robert Kagan. Uh, in the Atlantic, in the magazine that you write for. Uh, it's hard to tell our audience uh, the extent of despair about the future of American democracy. Uh, now, Robert is that kind of writer, so let's yeah. have a little discount factor here. But big, big picture, uh, you know, standing above Republican and Democratic weaknesses and strengths, how worried are you about the future of American democracy? So this is a question that for five years I've refused to answer. And I've refused no. to answer for not just, not because I'm too much of a scaredy cat to make predictions, but because um, I disapprove of this kind of prediction because predictions treat the future as a thing that exists about which statements can be made. Whereas the future is actually the, the product of decisions that we as individuals make. So, so the question is not, what do you see? The question is, what will you do? And uh, and to make predictions like this is to disavow one's own responsibilities. Uh, so, um, in the introduction, I said that I mean, I've I, I've um, uh, I've often made this joke that um, Ashken there are very few Ashkenazi optimists because evolution. Look, the, the optimist stayed, the pessimist left. Mm -hmm. So the pessimist had grandchildren and the optimist didn't. Um, so we are, we are genetically selected to be pessimistic and I'm psychologically pessimistic, but that's not a valid operational stance. You have to, even if you think like a pessimist, you have to act like an optimist. You have to believe that your actions matter and you have to get up every morning and do the job, um, believing that the outcome is is up to fate or destiny or God or whatever you believe in, but you have to do your best. And and so as I so I disapprove of this project. So let me ask, what will you do? I, I well, I do what I, I, I keep doing, which is I keep I, I make people I, I'm trying to make people believe first that what they have is is good and precious. And so on the one hand, you have to fight against those people who think um, who point to all the, the flaws in American history, you know, I sometimes think the, the way we ought to educate people is we ought to teach the very young to love their country and to believe that it's good and right. And then as they mature through adolescence and early adulthood, introduce them to the disconcerting facts, the troubling facts, the, the bad things that we did. Um, and, um, there's no shortage of those. But if you stop there, you leave people teenagers forever. You have to then bring them to adulthood by saying, I, I, am, I accept these things I did, and yet I still know that what I have is basically right. And this is a message, especially for Canadians. Um, I am, Canada is, has been going through a phase of national self-recrimination that is so without perspective, boundary, sense, comparison. Um, it's a kind of masochistic narcissism where um, it's like 
discovering that you're so you, you, it's like, it's such a shock to discover that mom and dad aren't perfect, that you believe they are monsters when they're just normal people, uh, better than most. And and I I just I, I just I just wish you could talk some sense into Canadians. I mean, what has been going on this year is so as I so narrow, so blind, so parochial, so limited, so childish. It has to stop. And people have to recover some sense of what, what the rest of the world is like. I mean, one of the things I, I text, I sent my wife um, from Nigeria is no more talking smack about the first world. Dave, we're going to go to the audience questions. And of course, given that we're at the Shar, the first question is, uh, how do you see the Biden administration's uh, policy toward Israel uh, evolving, not so much even what it is now, but what do you think it is going to look like? And then a second question, so you can talk about both at once. Um, the, United, the Biden administration has been putting pressure, and this, by the way, is not only the Biden administration, the Trump administration did it too, um, has been putting pressure on the Israeli government over its relationship with China, uh, the Haifa port, investment in China. Um, how do you see that? Yeah. Um, so I, I had, had a relative, or not exactly a relative, but a, a, someone who was as close to my family that he might as well have been a relative, who, who devoted much of his life to the Israeli nuclear program. And he lived to a great, great age. And like many people who did this kind of top, top security work, he was a man of the pretty far left. Uh, by Israeli standards. And I remember my last visit to him, and he was at this point a man of about 90. Um, he said, I only wish I could communicate to my fellow Israelis how secure this country is. Mm -hmm. And he gave his life to that cause, to making Israel. Israel has probably more nuclear warheads than Great Britain does. Mm -hmm. That's, um, cool. That's it, right. It may have almost as many as China. Um, so this is a major Power. Military power. It's a major technology power. Um, it's a major. It's a not a major economic power, but certainly, I mean, but its standard of living higher than most of Southern Europe. Um, so, I can tell you, David, when you say this, you are confounding most of the people who are listening tonight, and you are absolutely right. Why do you think that's so hard for worried Jews well, to believe? Well, a part of it is because we're older and we remember, I can remember my relatives packaging care packages for relatives in Israel because they needed sweaters. Um, and at this point, you know, I, I could just, I, I could just imagine my Israeli relative opening sweaters. They sent us sweaters. <laughs> what? If I need a sweater. I'll go to Uniqlo and buy a sweater. <laughs> buy eight. <laughs> um, so we have the memory of, of a different reality. Uh, we also have, as I say, we're genetically, the, the optimists stay, the pessimists left. Uh, the optimists don't have grandchildren, the pessimists do. And so we're shaped by that experience. Um, but American policy toward Israel doesn't matter that much for Israel's fundamental concerns because Israel is a very, very strong state. And, um, and the disagreements don't matter so much because first, uh, Biden is as as profound a, a friend as um, Israel could have. Um, and so one of some of the tensions are going to be that Biden is, is conscious of being such a good friend to Israel. He can tell him, you're being a jerk. Doesn't mean I don't love you, but you're, you're being a jerk right now. I don't like, don't talk to mom like that. Um, and uh, and the same thing with Kamala Harris, you know, I mean, Kamala Harris is um, married to a Jewish man. She's raised, a, she's spent most of her adult life or half her adult life in a Jewish family. I mean, she like feels like I, I can say these things. I can, I can, and I, I know I'm speaking from the inside here. Um, and, and I, 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 yes, there, I mean, the, there are the AOCs and the Ilan Omars, um, but Compared to the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's, that's just not where the power is. So I, I don't I don't worry about this, but I also don't think that the most relevant factors to Israeli security is American policy anymore. Um, I mean, it really is like saying, um, what is, I mean, it, you, we have to start start thinking of Israel as a little bit less like North York and a little bit more like France and Italy. 
Yeah. Um, it's it's a it is not a superpower by any means. It is not. It has many problems, but it is a major economic, technological, military power, um, and uh, and it's strong. Talk about and it's getting, and every year. Every year it gets strong. Like 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 you know, I, I used to have this joke I ran on on Twitter every that, that of. Like every time there's some Israeli breakthrough, there's this phrase, time is running out for the Jewish state. And I would like, you know, Israelis invent a machine that makes, you know, people with multiple sclerosis walk again. And I would quote that, like, time is running out. Like, the fact is, at any 10 year, at any moment, Israel seems to be in tremendous crisis. And at any moment, you look back 10 years ago and say, wow, this state is much, stand, you know, I remember when Saudi Arabia was richer than Israel. Israel is richer than Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's just, it, it goes from strength to strength. And, you know, I, I, I don't spend as much time there. I haven't spent as much time there recently. I mean, I had, like many of you, a, a daughter who was at one point considering staying. Um, and uh, so we were very, and I just, I just, I mean, and not to minimize the problems, but it is, um, it is not dependent on American protection in the way it was, it, well, it never, it, when it was dependent, it didn't get it, and now it gets it, and it doesn't fundamentally need it. Talk a little bit about the triangle of the United States, China, and Israel. China is, China is very interested in Israeli technology. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a surprisingly good relationship between Israel and China at a time when the relationship between the United States and China is surprisingly bad very quickly. Well, look, this is one of the areas where the United States and, is and Israel are going to disagree. And um, just as we are un, just as we know, the United States is fundamentally committed to French security, but it argues with France a lot. Um, that the United States and Israel are going to have some disagreements on this. But I also, I, here's a place where I'm really outside the Washington consensus. The one place where Biden policy has been most continuous with Trump policy is on China. Um, that Biden, Trump, and their people agree on these propositions. One, China is a incredibly wealthy and successful country becoming ever more wealthy and kind is it and, and, and in 15 minutes is going to catch up with and maybe overtake the united states that's, and not, two, that's not true and i've never yeah, I've, I've always thought that was mad yeah. um and um and i wrote an article for the atlantic before the well before the property crisis called china is a paper dragon yeah. about you know you go through air, indi indicator after indicator of strength like patents like the university system and China, it, it moved fast. Like, obviously, if, if from 1949 to 1989, your domestic policy is hitting your head with rocks and you stop doing that, um, you're gonna improve. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they stopped having man-made famines. They stopped having cultural revolutions. They began moving farmers from the farm to the cities and doing the kinds of things that the developed countries had done. And, and they made a lot of ground. But it's, it is fundamentally not a creative system. It, I mean, they don't have, the scientists can't speak freely. Um, and, uh, you know, they, and stealing intellectual property is a bad thing to do, but it's also self-harming because you create a culture in which people think the way to have intellectual property is wait, to wait for somebody else to make an invention and then steal it. But the system that is framed to steal is not the system that's framed to create. And the person who steals is always behind, has to be behind the person who creates. Um, and I'm also very worried about this, this instinct to drive toward confrontation um, because it, it can achieve the very result it's trying to prevent. So um, I, I think we have so much more to fear from the weaknesses in the Chinese system and the strengths. And we're, we may be about to discover how much. And with these two giant disasters, there are more unoccupied apartments in China than there are people in France. Uh, there, uh, the, the, the debt inside their state system is just incredible. Astounding. The pessimism, Astounding. If we talk about it in the debt in the US economy, it is nothing in comparison. To the mess then in China. Yeah. Uh, look, if, if you make a million dollars a year and you're carrying an $80,000 balance on your credit card, that's not smart. But if you need to pay the $80,000 off, you, I mean, it's just to say, let's look at what the debt is. 
without looking at the income and the assets is, is not a rational way to think. And the United States does carry more debt than it should, but it can amply afford it. And if it had to repay the debt, it should. And uh, when you hear these statistics about how much debt America owes to China, that, that always begins by omitting the fact the largest holder of U.S. debt is the social security system. And people say, well, let's not count that. And the second largest holder of U.S. debt is the Federal Reserve. Well, let's not count that. Okay, after the Social Security system in the Federal Reserve, then China is the last. Well, if you eliminate number one and number two, then yes, number three looks very big. David, time for one final question from the audience. And again, um, you're not going to be surprised, and I'm not going to be surprised. Uh, but I'm actually very interested in, in your answer to this one. Uh, it comes from Joyce Tanner, and she says there is an alarming rise of anti-Semitism in both the United States and Canada. How concerned are you about that? You just finished telling us how strong Israel is, mm -hmm. and you provoked a storm of controversy on the chat. Tell yeah. us how concerned you are about the rise of anti-Semitism. Well, we clearly see it. We see it in the far right in both countries. We see it in Europe. I mean, there, there's no denying um, that it is far more legitimate today to voice anti-Semitic tropes than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. There's a lot to say about this. So I'm, I'm going to think my, I'm going to take a moment to think about what is the, the most useful thing I can say to this audience. Look, obviously it's detestable. Obviously it's upsetting. And those of you who have children and grandchildren in the university system, you encounter it in ways that I'm sure are very hurtful. But I, I want to remind everyone, remember the story of, of Bilam and his donkey. Um, and he was called on to curse Israel and he couldn't do it. Um, Anti-Semitism, as hurtful as it is to Jews, as vicious and dangerous as it is, as ugly as all the associations, it does always more damage to the anti-Semite. Uh, because it makes you, anti-Semitism is fundamentally a conspiracy theory. Um, it, it, this is where um, anti-Semitism is different from other forms of prejudice. Most forms of racism are founded on contempt. Um, that the man who hates women despises women. The white who hates blacks regards blacks as lower, and, and so on. Um, but the people who hate Jews are not acting out of contempt, they're acting out of paranoia. And while contempt is morally reprehensible, uh, paranoia is intellectually debilitating. It means you can never understand how the word world really works. And, um, uh, and the anti-Semite anti is left to stew in ignorance and backwardness. Um, and that I, I don't think I'm not vain enough to try to hold God to the promise that I will bless them who bless thee and I will curse them who curse thee. I don't think it works that way. But I do observe that people and societies that succumb to this ailment do badly. Um, and that as hurtful as anti-Semitic prejudice in the Muslim world is to Jews and Israelis, who really suffers most from it? It's the Muslim world itself. It's never going to join. Uh, I mean, if you believe that the reason there are weather disturbances is because Jews are plotting to control the clouds. You are never going to have scientific meteorology. <laughs> um, you are just, you are crippling yourself. You're blinding yourself. So what I would say to everyone watching this about this is I, I don't want to minimize this at all, but be of courage and stout heart and understand um, that um, the people who do these things, uh, they don't deserve your sympathy because they're, they're, it's, it's, it, these are bad actions. But you need to understand who, um, who they're hurting the most and they're hurting themselves. They can never be full and equal participants in the modern world so long as they hold on to these manias. No, I think um, really, really, really um, important points for all of us to take away, David. I think it's, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to recognize Israel's strength, uh, which we don't do. And I think it's very important not to react to anti-Semitism out of deep fear. 
uh, laced with historical memories and devoid of context. So your, your last words, be stead of heart, I think are perfect. Uh, so thank you for them, David. I'm going to turn it over now. Just a pleasure. Uh, I yes. Thank you. Delight, a delight. I'm going to turn it over to Barbara now. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, David. It's my pleasure to formally thank our guests tonight on the Shar's behalf. David Frum and Janice Stein are both public intellectuals of a very high caliber and all Canadians for whom debate on the defining topics of our era is an important part of our lives are grateful for and proud of your contributions to the forum of ideas. Your deeply considered views are always articulated with lucidity as well as calm but steely rationality in both oral and written expression. These past years have been turbulent ones in so many ways. It's no accident. We are frequently reminded of the ominous lines from William Butler Yeats's 1920 poem, The Second Coming. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Tonight is a good time to suggest an amendment to those famous last two lines of the poem's first stanza. I think we can all agree that the worst today are indeed full of passionate intensity. But you, David and Janice, are here to remind us that the best amongst us do not all lack conviction. Your intellectual convictions, the vigor and civility with which you defend them are a balm to many a troubled soul, and I include myself in that number. Thank you so much in an age dominated by illiberal, to illiberal tendencies for your stewardship of the classic liberal tradition in the art of persuasion. May your tribe increase. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>